Uh, well, thank you guys for uh, having me on. I really appreciate it. This is uh, an honor, and uh, I, I'm just blown away that you guys asked me to do this. Um, as Mike and Phil said, I, I tend to blabber a lot on Twitter. Uh, I think I started back in 2008. Um, I was between jobs and found this thing called Twitter, and it became sort of my therapeutic venting mechanism. So it's gotten me in trouble a few times. But uh, tried to hang in there. Um, so there's a quote I wanted to start with. So basically uh, what this is about, or what I think it's about, um, is just covering how PowerShell fits into being a consultant, or at least from, from my side. Um, so what's about me? I'm a consultant right now working for Catapult Systems out of Texas. I live in Virginia. Um, I'm on social media. There's a couple of those, and you've probably seen my avatar. I'm just waiting for a cease and desist letter any day now. Uh, let's see. <laughs> That's what I really look like, so cover your eyes. Uh, and this is kind of a background of where I started. So back in the 80s, I was a drafter, got into CAD programming, well, CAD, then programming, uh, became uh, applications development. And then uh, a friend of mine who later went to work for Microsoft turned me on to System Center, which actually was um, SMS back in the day and how to deploy software and how to collect inventory. And I became completely fascinated by that. He also turned me on to uh, VB script and ASP and things like that. So that took me off a whole new direction. So somewhere between the late nineties and two thousands, uh, went into packaging and development, um, packaging meaning software um, to be deployed. And that was through a variety of things from SMS to Altiris and couple other platforms and kind of the name scatterbrains came about during a conversation where somebody said I bounced around things so much that I was a scatterbrains I said well there you go so uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell um, so how does PowerShell help as a consultant it's radically changed the environment um, I know some people out there are still sticking to uh, VB script and, and batch and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. They're still out there and you still have to deal with them. Uh, but PowerShell really has come from the back all the way to the front and way out in the lead now. And I would say if, if you're not working with PowerShell now, if there's anybody on this session that isn't, just do it. Make the leap, jump in, learn it. It's once you get it, it took me a while. Actually, I'll be honest with you. I signed on to the Monad beta, and I was like, eh, another language, okay, whatever. Um, and then I saw how the ecosystem kind of built up around it. And so there's four bullets at the top, greater flexibility. Um, basically what that's about uh, versus, you know, Windows Scripting Host and, and Batch, you have so much more you can do with it, with, you know, classes, with modules, with, you know, Object oriented. It leverages .NET, which is a whole other world. It's like having the ultimate Lego set. Um, it's more pervasive. It's on you know, Windows and Linux, Azure Cloud Shell. And it's also reaching into other things like you know, AWS and VMware service now. Almost every vendor now has you know, some support for PowerShell, if not a, a whole module or library. Um, and the ecosystem. So, you know, you have everything from PowerShell Gallery to GitHub and uh, Chocolatey and things like that. So there's there's so much more built up around it, and there's so much more content around it. So, I mean, 10 years ago, if you were trying to learn uh, VB script, you were out scouring websites and going to you know Stack Overflow and things like that, Reddit, asking questions and hoping to God somebody posted a decent answer and they didn't get into an argument. But with, uh, with PowerShell, it's it, it, it was lucky timing, right? The internet kind of matured around it at the same time. So there's YouTube tutorials, there's Plural Site, there's Linux Academy, there's Udemy, there's all kinds of learning utilities. There's eBooks out there. There's you know the PowerShell conference book. You have user groups like this one, which I think are the most undervalued. Um, in some cities, I see them taken more serious. Like where I'm at, it's pretty tough getting them going. Um, if you have one in your area and you're not going, go. <laughs> At least go to one, just get a feel for what they're like, um, and, and then just get an understanding that it's not really there to, to be the expert, but basically just to share ideas, share problems, and learn. 
You know, that's I go to I started a, a group for cloud users just to go there and learn, and uh, I'm learning tons every day, or every week, every month, excuse me. Um, so to disclaimers, yep, yeah, I'm not a PowerShell expert, so I'm not Lee Holmes, I'm not Jeff Hicks. <laughs> Uh, this is not going to be a 400 level session, so I'm not going to dive into really deep stuff. And my dog might explode, but she's sleeping on the couch behind me. So hopefully, knock on wood, she stays there. Uh, consulting challenges. Uh, if anybody who's a consultant on the line probably knows all these already, but if, you know, if you're not, so I, have to, I do talk to people from time to time who want to get into consulting, which uh, sometimes I talk them out of it. <laughs> sometimes I talk them into it. Depends on what your, what your uh, aptitude is and what you like doing. Um, it's constantly changing, um, both the environments, the problems, the, uh, the products, the platforms. You, you'll get hit with almost everything you can imagine and, and things you've never even heard of. Somebody will call you up and say, I can't get X to go with Y and Z and I need help. And you got to quick you know, scrounge around and figure out how to make that work. And PowerShell is a big part of that. And I'll get to that in a little bit in the going ahead. And coffee is your friend, okay? Just don't drink beer too much on the job. Uh, obstacles. It's not a panacea, so there are some things you got to watch out for. Uh, I run into these all the time, and I'm sure many of you do. Uh, customer calls you up, you remote into their site, and you find out, ooh, you're on 2008 R2, you got Windows 7, you haven't deployed WPF, whatever, to get PowerShell 5, you're still on 2, 3, or 4, and now you, you're having to deal with this weird mixed environment. With VBScript, you know everything's on 5.6 or whatever, and it just works, right, because it's had time to mature. PowerShell was starting to level out, and now it's moving again at a fast pace with PowerShell Core and PowerShell 6 and all that stuff and PowerShell 7. <laughs> so try to keep up with all of it. Um, so some of the things you run into at a, at a customer site are, you know, platforms, versions, uh, compatibility issues, Internet access. So you may have PowerShell 5 and you want to do install module and it's like kablam, you run into a firewall or some you know, InfoSec guy just says, no, you're not getting there. Uh, keeping your modules up to date, that's real common. I remote into sites and, you know, they're running DBA tools 0 0.8 dot something and I have to remind them that it's on 1 dot whatever now, um, things like that. So keep an eye on those. Um, also, the, the PowerShell, um, the PS provider, I'm trying to think of the name. Uh, PowerShell Get. PowerShell Get, when you install Windows 10, is still on like 1 dot whatever or 2 dot whatever. And I think the current version is much later than that. So one of the first things I do is upgrade that, which I'm wondering why the Insider build doesn't do that. I'm rambling here. Um, but the biggest issue of all these, the fourth one, FUD, <laughs> fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, people just don't want to learn it, don't want to let it happen. Um, my square wheels work fine. Why make them round? You know, that sort of thing. So just, I run into that. You see it more often in some environments based on the industry they're in than others. But it, it comes up quite often as a consultant. You just have to deal with it. Um, if I'm running too fast or you guys can't hear me, just throw a rock at me. No, you're doing great. So I just wanted to chime in here, and I'll throw a question out to you, and you can you can grab it whenever you want because in case you want to go in a particular order. but. I think, sure. what you're talking, I think what you're talking about right now is so interesting because for a lot of us on this call, we go to the same office on the same corporate network every day, and we, we kind of we always have a set environment. You could be walking into a different environment maybe every day, depending on how often you're, you're switching between clients. What's it like what you started to talk about here? What's it like to walk into a client? We have no idea what you have for tools to work with. How do you sort of figure that out? Uh, try to have a, a good open conversation. Make sure you have all the right people in the room. That's a big part of it. Um, some companies you might get one person. Who wants, it, it depends. And you won't learn this until after being with them for a while, what kind of internal political issues they have, because some places have them pretty bad and some don't. Um, I'm always very happy when I go into a place where everybody gets along great and nobody's talking smack behind each other's back. That's, that's fantastic. Um, but every now and then you run into an environment where there's a lot of us versus them. And the first group you meet tends to want to try to, uh, I don't want to say hoard, but kind of just occupy your time so they can get their two cents in before the other groups get hold of you. So it, you become sort of like the parent that comes in the room when the kids are fighting, you know. Mm -hmm. That happens. So the first thing I try to do is 
put that aside, not get, don't get, don't ever get drawn into the people side of it, you know, other than just pick out the information you can. So I try to find out, you know, just, just the facts, <laughs> like Dragnet. Um, you know, what do you have? Where is it? How many of this? What version? Um, who does what? I like to find out the organization um, because uh, it's hard to explain what I do. Uh, most of what I do is really about business process uh, automation or optimization, and a lot of it's whiteboarding, that sort of thing. So even I do tend to focus on certain products. A lot of it's outside of the product level. It's mostly sitting down and going, well, why do you do this? You know, they'll say, because we always have. And then, so I have to pick through that. So a lot of it's finding out what they do, how they do it, what they do it with, who does it. And then you know, once I line that up, I can start looking at it and going, hmm, okay, well, why are you guys doing it this way? I have other customers in the same boat as you. Maybe you're a bank and other banks are doing this. Why aren't you guys doing that? Not that it's right or wrong, but just curious why you're doing it different. Without a reason, maybe not. And in a good situation, they're receptive and they want to hear new ideas. That's great. I love working with them. And sometimes it's a long-range plan. It's not like, hey, go flip this switch and make it happen. It's um, here's some things to look at down the road. And I like to check in on them after a while. So I have several interactives. Um, at, at the beginning, obviously, scoping the project during the project. But even after it's completed, I like to follow up with customers and Ask them how things are going. Did you actually go and do this thing we talked about? You know, and if not, you know, why not? Did something change? Because I, I like to, that. It's a, it's like a conveyor belt in a way. Everything I do for a customer, when I go to the next customer, I roll forward what I've learned from the past customers. And this is true for any consultant. It's true for anybody working in a full-time job, right? I mean, your past employees, when you go to a new job, a lot of times you start with, well, my last job we did this. And, and you have this bag of... Um, experiences and, and tricks that you've used. And sometimes they fit great, and sometimes they don't. You have to drop them and move on to new ones. It's just that with, with consulting, it's it's a little bit more. Um, but as far as like how you engage a customer, first thing I have to do is you know, find out who's the head, you know, start at the top. Don't let the, don't let the classroom tell you who the teacher is. Let the teacher tell you who the classroom is. I try to find the chain of command, get that ironed out. Um, kind of get a feel for if there's any contention going on within the team. If it's not, then we just move into the, the technical side, um, that sort of thing. So it's, it's a very 50-50 people and technology balance. I mean, anybody who follows me on Twitter knows that I joke all the time about people are the worst things for technology because they are, right? <laughs> I mean, let's face it, software didn't break itself, right? It didn't make the 737s fall out of the sky. Somebody had to program that and make it happen. So somewhere a human process failed and that's usually what happens you know whether it's you know it's never dns well somebody set up dns wrong they didn't put scavenging in and again i'm rambling here sorry um that's just an example so most times when i look at things it's it's rarely purely a technology issue it's usually a, a people issue it's usually a process a people a culture um a personality issue you know two people not getting along so they just don't communicate so things just don't happen um, so it's sorting through all that. How's that for a short answer? <laughs> Half the people are probably asleep by now. <laughs> um, do you find, do you find um, when it comes time to starting to do work, if you're trying to do stuff command line, if you, you know, since we're talking PowerShell, if you're trying to run scripts and do that kind of stuff, do you have a battle just trying to get people to let you onto that network to do the things you want to do? Uh, is there a lot of resistance to people saying, hey, consultant wants to plug in laptop and run scripts kind of deal? Um, no. I would say most of the time, no. And I know I, paint a, I painted somewhat of a dismal picture there. I would say 95% of the customers I run into, um, you know, they're reaching out for help, right? They're, they're going to a consulting firm because they need help whether it's, you know, staffing overload or it's, it's some new technology they don't know. Um, they want help. So usually they're receptive. Um, so they're like, you know, it's in your hands. Tell us what to do. You get a lot of that, which is nice. And I have to be careful. I don't want to, you know, you can't get too overconfident and screw up because it's a lose-lose if you do that. So I have to be careful not to just say, here's my script, run it. I, I don't like to do that. What I like to do is first uh, make sure they have a test environment or some kind of a test scenario so that when, whatever I do the first time, it's not going to hit production. 
Um, and then it's usually walking through and figuring out, you know, I'll ask some questions up front. How familiar are you with PowerShell? Um, what's your level of understanding about, you know, the registry, the file system, networking, and so forth. Just so I know they understand what it's touching um, and go from there. So it's, it's not really unlike a, a, any other job. It's just that, you know, it's kind of like starting a new job more frequently, if that makes sense. So um, it's more about getting to know what their comfort level is. And you know, if they have a, a concern, I have to work through that. I have had customers like, let's say with a config manager, I want to turn on Pixie. And they're like, no, we're not turning on Pixie because we've heard stories. It'll image every machine in the environment. So I hear that a lot and I'm sure other people have. So you get things like that with PowerShell. Like we can't turn on remoting because if you turn on remoting, then hackers will come flooding in from North Korea and take over our network. Um, so you kind of have to explain some of those nuts and bolts to people so they understand what the real risk is and, and how remote it is in some cases, it's not as you know scary as it might seem. So does that does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I, I what I was really trying to do more than anything was you know just to see what it's like from your from your set of eyes, and then really just get the conversation going because sometimes I find that we have people. Uh, in chat or joining us who probably have a question they want to ask and they just need to kind of hear some people talk about a few things. So I figured let's get the conversation going a little bit. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, cool. Um, I wish I could keep the chat window open while I'm presenting, but it seems to hide it. So if I'm not seeing your question, um, when I get to a point where I can see that, I'll definitely try to respond to those. Unless when you Don't go, worry, Mike, Mike will be happy to interrupt, and I'll be happy. <laughs> okay, no, no worries. <laughs> I'll move on from that boring slide. Okay, so uh, in this <laughs> playing around with slides, so uh, I know there's some things to manage, and nobody on this call should be surprised by any of this. You're going to deal with all kinds of weird stuff, and there's for everyone that's on here, there's probably ten more I'm not putting on here. Just stuff out there that you got to deal with. Somebody calls you up and says, "I got to make this." thing happen, this process. It needs to read from here, process here, and go to here, right? That could be, you know, uh, get identity from here, go to the cloud from here, file system from here, networking, containers, whatever, and um, move things around. It's all about moving information around, right? So uh, I told one of my kids' classrooms, they asked me what I do for a living. I said, I move electronics, electrons around and get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth, right? I write, write software code or push buttons and make things move around on a disk somewhere, and somebody pays me. So a lot of it's to do things like this, just connect stuff and make it happen. And your app is, you know, whatever. It can be a combination of any of these things. Like right now, I'm working on one, two, three, four, five of these at one time. You know, a customer needs something to move from A to B to C, and I have to figure out how to make that happen. So um, I think it was... Either John Jones or Jeffrey Snover said that uh, PowerShell is a glue. It's the ultimate glue, and it really is. I mean, I know Python's great and Perl's great, um, but coming from the Windows platform, which is pretty much ubiquitous everywhere in the business environment, PowerShell is just it, right? It's just it's come to the top as being the thing to glue things together. So when I need to spin up VMs or copy files or connect to you know Office 365 or and deploy devices to Intune, um, whatever, um, and third-party apps up at the top there. It's just a nice glue to do that with. So when people say, how well do you know PowerShell? Knowing what PowerShell is in the language is just half of it. The rest of it is knowing what you can do with it, right? You can know a hammer, great, but you got to know how to build a house with it. So it's really two, two mountains to climb. You know, for one is learning the language and how it works, the syntax, how functions work and all that, and just understanding some of the weird little nuances with arrays and stuff like that, like any language, right? Just learning the new language and how it works and what it does. And then you have to learn what it can do. So, I, okay, I'm, now I'm going to connect to VMware. What can I do with PowerShell against VM or Azure and that sort of thing? So, it's not like learning DB script where, you know, it's kind of like its own thing and you rarely stepped outside of that. Really, PowerShell it is a glue. So you really have to learn a lot of, or at least a little of all these things if you run into them. So it's opened up a huge world. Um, and here's some examples from things I've worked at in the last 
four years, um, deploying applications, uh, database migrations, and ETL. The ones in Asterix is the ones I'm doing right now. Um, provision, actually, provision, deprovision user counts I'm working on too. Uh, auditing, compliance reporting, and don't construe that to mean on, on any of these that I have to write all the code, and I'll get to that in a minute. So a lot of people I talk to get freaked out about PowerShell. Like, oh my God, I can't write. I don't understand this language. I don't know what to do. You don't have to write it all, and that's part of the beauty of it. So my click works. Uh, I cut these out a little bit out of order. So lifestyle best practices. Uh, this is kind of just general stuff. Document everything. Um, look for a module first. That's what I'm going to harp on here in a minute. Uh, ask questions, get help. Yep. Uh, pick a version control system. Even if you're by yourself as a consultant, if you work alone, still find a version control system and use it. Doesn't matter what it is. I use GitHub. Some people like other things. Um, GitHub's free. They added, uh, they have pretty nice support for private repos, so it works pretty well. Uh, and people ask it, why? I don't need to control version. Um, even when you're working alone, you're gonna screw up. <laughs> and it's nice to be able to revert and roll back. Like, oh, let's go back to the one that worked. So much nicer than having to go find your own backup copy and, you know, Dropbox or whatever you keep, you know, your own homegrown thing. Uh, it's just nice to be able to roll back. Um, very nice. And if you need help, you can invite somebody in to say, hey, I can't figure this out. Uh, here's an invite. Look at my code. Help me figure it out. They can figure it out, send you a thing, a pull request. You can say, ooh, that looks good. I'll roll that in and you're good to go. So it's just, it's conducive to a team um, approach. Uh, refactor, refactor, refactor. If you don't know what refactoring is, it's like going back and just cleaning it up, simplifying um, if I'm doing this thing three times, maybe I'll make it a function and call it you know, once for each one, um, set a variable once and use it over and over instead of refetching it, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> refactor some more. And finally, never stop refactoring. So um, modules. I call them life rings because uh, a lot of people feel like they have to write everything from scratch. There's nothing wrong with why you're learning to write from scratch. I still do it you know, when I want to just figure something out. Even when I know there's a module, I'll still write some code to figure out how that module's doing it so I can understand what it's doing. And sometimes even to figure out what it might be missing and then I can actually contribute to it if it's on GitHub. So that's another nice thing about GitHub. You can contribute to other people's stuff. Um, but some of these modules, the ones in green, um, Azure, the, the new AZ modules, almost done taking over from Azure RM. I still see Azure RM out there. Azure AD, Active Directory, uh, ADSI PS is nice. It's an old ADSI um, alternative uh, built as a module for if you're on a system where you're not allowed to install RSAT, which you'll run into as a consultant. Sometimes you'll say, well, I need this. And they'll say, you can't have this. <laughs> so you got to work around it. Um, so uh, Exchange Online, that's a little bit of a different animal. So that, that involves setting up a session and connecting to it. A little different. Um, Office 365, Teams, and so on. Um, Multi-purpose, I mentioned Carbon and Posh 365, and I have a comment. There. There's hundreds of those out there. If you search PowerShell Gallery, and I, I'm guessing some of the, most of the people on this call probably have seen most of these and know what they are. Um, basically, they're just toolboxes with functions built to deal with these things, like SQL Server. There's, you know, SQL Server is a module that Microsoft provides. There's also DBA tools that Chrissy Lemaire and her, her team provides, and they have nice, you know, functions for doing things with SQL Server, databases, um, server configurations, things like that. Um, configuration Manager has its own. So a lot of Microsoft products have their own modules that come with them, like Hyper-V, um, System Center, the various parts of that. But now you're seeing it with AWS. You know, there's a module for that, VMware, ServiceNow, um, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Terraform, on and on and on. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of modules out there. So you don't have to, you don't have to start from scratch. That's the thing I, I like to remind people about. You know, go find a, a module. If it, if you're looking to solve a problem and you're dealing with something in particular, like let's say Azure AD, well, first thing I do is dive into that module. It, that's all documented online. Go look at what it can do. Look at the examples. Um, start playing with them. 
you can create a, an Azure tenant for free. Um, you can also just throw your credit card out there like I did and buy a pay as you go, which is nice. Um, and start working with it. That's the best way to learn. I mean, you can watch tutorials, you can read books and all that. And that they're very useful, but until you get your hands on it, a lot of times it, the rubber doesn't meet the road until you just do it. Um, and out of all these, a lot of these have come about because a customer calls and says, I'm having a problem with X and it's that X is something I have not ever dealt with. First thing I'll do is look and see what's out there. Is there a module for that? Are they using it? If not, why not? And I, can say, oh, I see what you guys did. You wrote your own code and there's a module that will do that. You want to try that. Sometimes that's a problem. So it's nice to have that as an option. With VBScript, things like that, Kickstart and those older languages, those things are very tough to find. If you were lucky, if you found somebody's website like you know SS64 or um, any of those really great useful sites from back in the day that had tons of example code. But again, it wasn't like a, a market. You couldn't just go find it and install it like you can with you know install module. So PowerShell really has made it a lot easier. It's almost like handing you a remote control instead of having to get up and use a pair of pliers on the TV set. Um, Boy, am I rambling? Sorry, had a lot of coffee and a beer. So, no, that's kind of good stuff. I wanted to just mention too is to, um, is there any other you know like uh, resources that you use to go find that stuff? So like yeah. you mentioned Carbon, I'm like, what is Carbon? And I went and found it. I'm like, oh, I could use Carbon now. Yeah, but, so uh, I'll, I'll yeah I'm gonna hit those in a, a little bit. Um, some resources for learning and finding new things. Yeah, finding new things. Okay, cool. Yeah, so. That's a good question. That comes up a lot too. Like, where do I start? Or where do I look? Um, I have a list uh, coming up here in a minute. So my personal favorite modules I use a lot, and this list changes up quite often, but PS Windows Update is nice. I can use that to fire off Windows updates against local or remote machines. Um, DBA tools I use all the time. OSD Builder is great if you're doing imaging. If you uh, use SCCM or MDT and you need to build Windows 10 images, fantastic. Um, David Segura, the guy that runs that, he's constantly making tweaks and adjustments to that. So if anybody on this is not on Twitter, get on Twitter. Um, I I really, I should get a check from Twitter for how much I defend them. Because I know people <laughs> want to smack about Twitter. Yes, Twitter has a lot of junk out there. But Twitter is the ultimate um, a la carte. It's like cable TV if you were allowed to pick only the channels you wanted and nothing else. That's Twitter. So my response to people is if you're getting junk, it's because you subscribe to junk. So change what you subscribe to, and it can be an awesome experience. Most of the people I know in the tech world I know from Twitter. Most of the information I get is from Twitter. It hits Twitter before it hits any blog, any newsletter, anything else. Uh, Twitter is the first. It's a fire hose. So good luck keeping up, but hey, it's fun to try. Um, Carbon is, it's a Swiss army knife of toolboxes. <laughs> it's like a Swiss army knife of Swiss army knives. It's just this one size, uh, I don't know how to describe it. Well, go look at it. Just go to PS Gallery and look at carbon, click on the package details and look at the functions. And you'll see it's just loaded with stuff. It's just kind of a, a, a multi-purpose utility widget. Um, IS administration, that, comes with Windows Server if you have IIS installed. Uh, configuration Manager comes with System Center Configuration Manager, or if you have uh, the console installed. If you install the console, you get the PSD1 and the DLL with it. POS365 is a module written by a friend of mine named Kevin Blumenfeld. It's nice for um, encapsulating some of the things you use to connect to Azure, um, Azure uh, AD, Office 365, Exchange Online, things like that, like um, just making it cleaner and easier to connect to and query things. It's kind of nice. Um, Powerline is a, a, a utility set for PowerShell itself. So it does things like customize the, the uh, command prompt. It's really nice. Um, there's plenty of stuff out there. I won't go into a whole lot of detail on that. Uh, and my list changes all the time. Other ones I've used are like Platypus for doing documentation, um, Pastor for doing you know, test-driven development. Um, so my list changes. Don't ever get stuck in one way because the landscape is changing. That's all I can say. Regardless of what you do in IT, especially in 2019, with the way things are doing whatever as a service, you see the words as a service on everything now. Um, it just means that they're in a, a CI/CD mindset. 
It's rapid deployments, agile scrum, everything's faster, faster, faster. Uh, and, and in fact, it's, it got so fast, they're actually trying to throttle it back. So I just saw some news that Windows 10 is going to change some of the way they do their servicing updates um, to try to give some relief to sysadmins. So you're going to see a lot of that in the next year or two. There's going to be still some testing and adjustment as they see what customers are um, willing to deal with as far as the rapid pace of change because it's getting faster. The ability to deliver is getting faster. So you're going to see PowerShell modules pop up more often for things, and you're going to see some go away and some combine. Um, so just keeping your eye on that landscape is important, whether you're a consultant or not, I would say is, is important. Uh, resources. So. so let me just jump in there for a second. So, so to, to bring around a lot of what you just said, um, it sounds like one of the main things that you deal with as a consultant is sort of being a litmus test for people. You go to these environments, you kind of pick up best practices on, on your own and see what works in a bunch of these environments and come to other environments. And you basically say to people, hey, I see what you're doing there. Did you consider doing it this way? A lot of people are doing this. Would you consider this? So you're there sort of as a sort of maybe to solve a problem, but also to say, um, you guys have your world, and your world is this box, but I see what's in every box that's around your box, and you guys are doing it a little different than everybody. Maybe we'd be a little better off looking at it from this point of view. Yeah. Um, I have to be careful how I say that. Um, if you come at it with any smell of arrogance, it sure. Really put up a roadblock. So you have to come at it with a, a, a very um, a gentle approach, if you will. Um, and, and again, so it just depends on the personality you're dealing with. Sometimes they're, they're super hungry and want to learn everything. And, then, and those are great. I, I, it's, you can't go, I, I can't spend enough time on a phone call with some customers that just want to learn. And, and I just love pointing them to things. I'm not going to teach them everything. I like pointing people to things. I'm not I'm not the expert on everything, but what I do feel good about is my ability to point people in the right direction. They want to know about this. So I'll say, ah, go check these things out and send them off on a journey. And then I like to check back when I'm, you know, in a month or two and see where they are. And it's, it's funny because uh, three or four of the people I've worked with in the past year um, in particular were like, uh, I, I don't get this PowerShell thing. And now I'm looking at them and they're like, they're ahead of me in a lot of stuff. They just went nuts with PowerShell. Um, it, it's amazing. It's it, Basically, it's like anything else. Once you find something to use it on, it's like an aha moment. It, it, that's true for a lot of people, me in, in particular. I, I can't just learn a language. I have to have something to use it on. It's like, well, here's a hammer or a wrench. Okay, I got a wrench. This is cool. I can adjust it. Okay, what do I do with it? Oh, here's a kit to build your own dragster. Oh, okay. Now I know what to do with it. So now I'm using this wrench like crazy to build this dragster. So, when you put a project in front of somebody or they see something that they can do with it, they go crazy. They just, they're off. You know, you just stand back and watch. And so most of the cases I run into, that's what I see. It's, I don't have to really nudge them. I just say, you know, um, Hey, have you looked at this? You know, here's an, here's an idea. And they look at it and they go, Oh, that's cool. And it, it might be a blog post that somebody posted about how to do something. And they go, Oh, I never thought of doing that. Um, or a video or whatever. And then they, I want to know more. So then I'll point them to other stuff, like the things on this list here. Uh, if, you want to, if you want to dive in deep, there's Twitter, Reddit, Slack, GitHub, explore other people's GitHub repos. Um, books, um, I can't say enough for those because they're kind of self-paced. User groups. If you have a user group anywhere near you, go to them. And here's something I, I recommend to customers all the time. Even if it's not in something you do, Go to it anyways. At least go to one session. I go to like Python and Ruby sessions, even though I don't use them. Because it's nice to know what other people are doing. They can give you ideas of what you can do in PowerShell or other things that you're working on. There's a lot of cross-pollination. Um, and also uh, the, the, the training sites like Pluralsight, Udemy, Linux Academy, they're on and on and on. Uh, those are great. YouTube, I didn't mention that. Uh, Twitch, if anybody's not familiar with Twitch, it's mostly known for, uh, you know, watching gamers go crazy playing games. 
but people like Marky Krause, uh, that's E period, not Marky, like Marky Mark, um, and Chrissy Lemaire, and, and there's other people, will do live sessions where they get on there and they'll just code in real time. Like, hey, I'm trying to figure this problem out. And they'll talk while they're doing it. And it's, it's an amazing learning experience to watch them dissect a problem and watch how they work through it. You know, like, oh, here, I could have used this. And, you, and they'll say it. And they'll say, oh, I could have used an array here instead of you know, whatever. Um, and they'll go back and they'll change code. You can watch them work through it. It's, it's, it's like it's over the shoulder, like in the most perfect way, in a, in a, in a, in a sort of a 19, well, whatever, 2019 sense. So all these are great. Some people are just more receptive to some of these than others. So whether you want to read something static like a blog post, or you want to see videos, or you want to interact in conversation. People have different ways that they learn best. Um, I find that with customers, so I point them to these things depending on what I feel is their aptitude and watch them go. So getting back to your question, <laughs> you know why they call me scatterbrain. Um, basically, it's just trying to fill out what their aptitude is. Are they receptive? Are, are they resistant? Are they eager? A lot of it's the human side. Once you get that sorted out, then I know kind of what to, to put in front of them. So if they're really receptive and eager to learn, you know, hey, I just, here you go. These are all these things. Go go at it. Um, I'll send them some articles that might focus in on some specific things that they're looking to do. Um, I'll point them to, to forums or sites to ask questions. I mean, I'm not going to ask a question about why, why does right output no enumeration work the way it does. Go to Slack and post it, and Rob Reynolds will answer it, <laughs> okay? And he'll answer it better than I do. But I can point you to Slack, you know, PowerShell channel. Um, so that's right. I see my value. I don't see my value as, like, being this, you know, fountain of information. I'm just sort of like uh, the hall monitor at a school saying, yeah, the gym's that way, cafeteria's that way, <laughs> some PowerShell classrooms down there. Um, so that's – I kind of do that with customers. I do that with, you know, colleagues, coworkers. And then I try to use it on myself, um, and I reach out for help. So, I mean, everybody's learning. So it's not like I have all the answers. I mean, I, I'm constantly on Skype and Teams calls and whatnot with my colleagues and saying, hey, I can't figure this out. What do I do? So um, I mentioned that earlier. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't ever feel like it's an admission of failure. Everybody asks questions. Um, I don't know if anybody follows Chrissy Lemaire on Twitter. If she's on here, don't, don't hit me. Um, I can't see the list of people. She posted a comment the other day. Somebody said something, hey, I'm using this function to do something. And she said right away, I can't figure out how to make that work. I thought, holy crap, if she can't figure out how to make that work, I know I'm not going to figure out how to make it work. <laughs> so I'm going to have to go read, you know, secondhand how to make something work. So this, this stuff is moving fast. Nobody is on top of it 100% of the time. Everybody's learning something new. I guarantee you Jeff Hicks at least once a week says, hmm, I didn't know that. Right? So – I just try to encourage people not to ever feel like if they don't have all the answers that it, it's too insurmountable. It's never insurmountable. You can learn. And there's a million ways to learn. There's, there's way more ways to learn now than there was five years ago. It's, it's incredible. So, boy, am I rambling. Uh, is anybody still awake? <laughs> no, man, we're doing a good job. We're, we're here, and it's going great, man. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. If you were here, I'd buy you a coffee. Um, so, so uh, three of the projects I'm working on right now, actually four. There's four. I didn't get that on here. ETL, so that's extract, transform, and load. That's an old term for just basically moving data from one place to another. Um, and that can be, that's a very generic term. So for anybody who's not familiar with that, that could be like uh, anybody who writes reports does basically ETL. You're reading from somewhere, generating some kind of an output and giving it to somebody else in a different form, right? So for a, for a database admin, a DBA, it means, you know, reading from these databases and populating some other database or moving from tables to tables. Uh, but it can be anything. So in my case, I'm pulling from REST APIs and populating SQL, or I'm going from Azure AD to Azure AD. So that's another one I'm doing right now for a customer. Um, so some examples um, for REST API, I can't go too detailed on these because of um, NDA stuff, but these are these all apply to a lot of people. I'm sure a lot of people on this call have run into this or will run into this. Um, you're going to run into a, a, 
a customer or maybe at your employer where you've signed on to some cloud service that does something like, I don't know, timekeeping, benefits, um, HR, payroll. Um, in this particular case, uh, it's a, a delivery service that runs, you know, trucks and vans and whatnot, and they have a system for tracking uh, the vehicles, where they are, what office they answer to, um, what division or department they belong to, who the driver is that day, which driver checked it out at this time and when did they check it back in. Um, they also have telemetry on the vehicles that tracks where they go, how fast they're driving, how often they hit the brakes. Um, and yeah, it gets pretty deep. So what they wanted was, um, uh, we have an automation platform my company builds in Azure that um, is basically a managed services uh, process, if you will, for doing onboarding and offboarding of employees and things like that. And they wanted to extend that to say, okay, I know you're, you're creating their, their Active Directory account, their mailbox, and adding them to groups and so forth. Um, can we also add them to this third-party vendor site and assign them an account so that we can check them out of vehicle when they go off to deliver? So we automated that. So um, that vendor has a REST API, and basically that's just an API you can query over the web. So PowerShell has this um, uh, a, a method for doing that. I'm trying to think of the name. It's new web request package. Another screen. I just. I think it's in that invoke mm -hmm. web request. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, you know, you have to. It, you hope to God they have a decent document. That's the biggest challenge with those people is how well they documented their API. Um, some do, some don't. And you try to pick through their examples and go, okay, I see I have to connect and authenticate, and I can send this query that says, you know, give me all your users. Okay, is that user there? No. Okay, now here's a, another request to add a user and so on. Um, so I'm working on that kind of stuff. And that's, there's a lot of things, that's happening more and more because now more and more things are becoming SaaS or software as a service as well as PaaS um, and third-party vendors like ServiceNow and, and hundreds of others are piling into that. They don't want to have to run on-prem software inside of every customer site. They'll do it in the cloud and have you subscribe. And um, It's not terribly unlike um, setting up an Office 365 account, right? So when you create a user in Azure AD, put them in a group and that sort of thing, um, it's very similar, right? You have an API that you're querying through PowerShell. Sometimes it's a PowerShell module does it. Sometimes you have to query a REST API. Um, sometimes it's through graph. They have There's different ways to get to them and connect. It's just basically a different cable to get from A to B. Um, you're going to run into that a lot more. So this, this term ETL, all it really means is moving data around or copying data around. So I want to generate some output from these three sources uh, or one source to one source. It's generic. So there's a lot of tools for that. Microsoft Flow is great for that. Um, Azure Automation is great for that. Uh, serverless functions and um, uh, what am I thinking of? Uh, ser um, functions. I'm trying to think of a name for Azure. Ah. Something app. I'm drawing a blank. It's like a, a functionless uh, server type. Logic apps. Logic apps, thank you. Um, and Amazon has theirs, like Lambda and some other things. Um, and I believe Google does, GCS, um, and so on. So you're going to run into this more and more. So this is going to become more and more common, that first one. You're going to see that a lot more often. As things start to move a little bit more cloud than on-prem, and that's my cat in the background, I apologize. Um, you're going to see more and more need to connect to remote things over the cloud. Um, so start playing with that as soon as you can. Uh, I would recommend that. I'm doing a lot of work with that, uh, as well as a lot of people I work with. Uh, Config Manager Health Check Reporting. Um, CM Health Check is a module uh, I put together. I didn't write it completely from scratch. Um, Rafael Perez, I believe it is, uh, he started it. He wrote it as just a PowerShell script. And he borrowed from some work from David O'Brien and some other people. And he put it out there and said, here you go, here's a tool to query Config Manager and see you know, how healthy is it. Are there any alerts, are there errors, are there any best practices being violated, um, so forth and so on. All I did was take it, update it, 
to work with newer versions of System Center, um, newer versions of Office, because it, it only would output to Word. It only worked with 2015, so I'd add 2016. Um, I basically just put some uh, put some lipstick on it, and then I made it a module. And since then, the only thing significant I did to it was really um, add web reporting, so it generates an HTML report. But that that is used fairly often, and I haven't done a lot of changes to it, but every now and then somebody hits me with something, hey, can you do this? So it's up in GitHub. It's open source, um, like everything else I've got up there. You can look at it. You can laugh at it, throw darts at it. <laughs> you can submit uh, pull requests if you want to fix it. That's great. Um, the third one, post-patch systems validation. Uh, a lot of managed services providers, um, like our company does, is one of their things. Um, customers contract you to basically, you know, outsource something they're doing that either they don't have enough staff for, they just don't want to deal with, uh, whether that's patching or upgrading, um, security monitoring, things like that. Uh, a, lot, a lot of times when they have to do a maintenance on a system, whether it's um, servicing or patching or whatnot, they need some uh, tools to basically say, you know, is it back online? Is everything working like it should? And they don't want to have to have a person remote in at you know, three in the morning and test these things and say, yep, I give it a thumbs up. Now I'm going to bed. Um, they want it automated. So some of the things you can query for using PowerShell are services, ports, network shares, web responses, basically sending a web request and then checking the response, either the code or the actual content, uh, database queries. Um, there's some other things you can do, like checking reboot reboot order. Uh, that's one thing that we've been doing more lately is, you know, we rebooted these 20 servers, but they have to come up in this order. Is there a way to check to see that they did come up in that order? So one thing you can do with PowerShell is, you know, through WMI or SIM is query the last reboot time. And you can make sure that they come back up in an order that matches the order you expect. Um, I mean, these are things you could do with VBScript and other languages, but it's so much easier in PowerShell. Things that were like 10, 20 lines, you can do in like one or two lines. Um, I don't have to copy scripts. I can install a module, um, that sort of thing. In, in some cases, you don't even have to install a module. You can actually run it off the web. I don't know if anybody's ever worked with Chocolatey, but you can actually install Chocolatey using Invoke Expression. So there, there's a lot of ways you can do things. I don't want to say light touch, but it's, it's kind of like light touch where you barely have to do anything to make it happen. It's just much easier. So, any questions, questions around these things? So, some of the, some of the, some of the like, bring in some of these, like, managed service providers kind of thing. Do you have a, a, a for customers to come in and say, hey, I want you to just, uh, you know, run this code or is, a lot, is there a lot of, like, validation and saying, you know, hey, their architects are going to go, hey, you know, help me architect this out and then put this process together, or is it typically, you know, bring you bring you know, kind of consultants in to basically almost do the work for them? Is that a typical thing, or is it they're, they're not so much in the, hey, just do, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure, you know, I'm just asking the question. No, I, I think I think I understand. If I, if I get it wrong, let me know, but... Um, I can't speak for everybody, so I'm, I'm sure there's going to be different experiences out there. For the ones I've run into, usually they know what they want. We just want to know that this system did, you know, this is back up. Uh, you figure it out, and just as long as you can explain it to me that makes me feel comfortable, I'm good with it. So we'll develop it. We'll test it. Um, we'll run a test run in their environment with their help, making sure they understand what we're testing and how we're testing it. Um, show them the results. Uh, it can be iterative sometimes, like they'll say, that's nice, but can you do this? So we'll make some adjustments. Um, but as far as, like, them getting in and, like, you know, guiding what we do with, like, uh, no, code it this way versus that way, I haven't seen that in our environment. Usually if they're that adept, they'll just do it themselves, um, which does happen. Sometimes they'll call us and say, we, we built this thing, but we're having a problem. Can you help us fix it? Um, that's a little bit different of a scenario. But if they're actually outsourcing, you know, checking on things, They'll, they'll usually trust a consultant to build that thing as long as it meets their requirements. Is that Do you have any concerns sometimes about putting in processes? I mean, granted, it's the consultant thing, but you know, I think some – Phil, you're breaking up. The, the, the yeah, your audio is dropping. Yeah. Phil, you're dropping on your audio. 
Yeah, I think. So I'll right, so well, try again. Yeah, you're good now. The question that I have, sorry, hopefully. It's more, it's not more, but it's kind of a, a related question. Um, with the putting in a, a procedure or a script module for it long term, I think it's, it's a one it's a unique case with, as a consultant, but you know, some of the things that I kind of bring in with my company is like, hey, is this something that I want to you know, do? Or implement and make the process better, but then, all right? Well, who else is going to support it? Is it going to be me? Now, I think it's a different case for like a consulting company to come and say, "Hey, yeah, we're more than happy to you know, continue to pay this consulting dollars to maintain and, and continue to yeah. upgrade and, and you know, you know that that process, you know, to see how how what what." comes from from the consulting side. Yeah, we're more than happy to you know, continue to you know research these modules and all that kind of stuff and, and because hey, once again, you know, in a year when you need to Yes, I I, I I totally get that. So it really depends on the scope of the engagement. So when when you're first meeting with the customer, it's important to really clarify what they want now as well as going forward. So if they really don't want to have to deal with it, they want to outsource it, um, that's one thing, right? So usually that's all spelled out in your statement of work. Um, if it's something they want you to hand over to them, that's another thing. So a lot of, uh, it's very common, I won't name any names, but almost every consulting firm has some boilerplate um, terminology in their statements of work. Like if we develop scripts for you, they become properties of the customer and, you know, there's certain obligations and that it'll say like we have to document this it has to meet these certain you know general requirements it won't get down to the line by line but usually they'll say it's got to be documented sufficiently for them to be able to take it over and that's if you're you know handing them a tool so here here's a script good luck call me if you have problems that's one thing if you're a managed service provider or you're providing an outsourced service usually it's worded differently like that that content is your intellectual property so again this becomes you know a debate between two attorneys on a golf course with martinis, right? So it's going to be uh, worded differently to say, you know, it's our property as long as it provides these things. So it sort of black boxes it. Now, as far as how it's supported going forward, like if I get hit by a bus, that's really up to the managed service provider how mature their environment is. I'm lucky in my environment because I've been in others that aren't like this, but in our environment, because our company started as a software development shop, they're very well tuned to things like um, agile and um, uh, CICD and pipelines and they have a very mature process for maintaining content documentation version control uh, promotion from you know dev to test to prod production um, and those worlds are starting to merge right so I don't want to get into the whole DevOps thing but DevOps is is an interesting area because that's where all the stuff is starting to collide and it's causing some friction a lot of sysadmins aren't used to this stuff, um, but developers are. So it's it's sort of bringing infrastructure people into development practices to make those things happen, like you're talking about. You know, documenting your code, um, following best practices for making it modular, supported, and things like that. Um, controlled, so not everybody can come in and tweak it and mess it up. Uh, is also having some accountability. Who do you call? You want to have some abstraction. You don't want to have to call Jim. You want to be able to call the support department. So you have to have that sort of um, fault tolerance built in. So if, if you're a customer on this meeting right now and you're listening to me blabber away, um, be careful hiring an independent. It, it's fine to hire an independent, but just make sure that you have you keep an eyeball on what happens if they're hit by a bus or they catch Ebola while they're on some vacation. Um, what do you do? You know, are you able to support it? Is it something that you could get somebody else in to support? Do they have a backup? So that's, you know, one of the appealing things about a larger company, because I've worked in both of those, actually every mix of those from small, medium to really ridiculously large, that there's different appeals for those. A small guy is more independent, agile, flexible, can throw stuff out there quicker. You call them direct, you get a fix done right away. Uh, but, you know, gets sick, doesn't answer the call, now you're stuck. Um, the big company is slower, but they have more redundancy. They have more um, 
rigorous control over things. So it's a trade-off. Do you want it fast, you know, good, fast, or cheap, right? Those are the three things. So as far as how customers are receptive to that, it just depends. You know, if they want us to hand them something that they can use and they're going to maintain, I'll pay much more attention to documenting it for them. You know, basically, it's just like putting it out for open source, right? I want it so anybody in the general public can pick it up and run with it and figure it out. Um, I don't want them to have to call me for every um, But if it's something me or my company is going to maintain, that's different. I have to follow internal practices, and it's it's a it's a different game. So does that does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it was great. So so David, I think you uh, <laughs> I, I think you hit on an area. We got a few questions here, so. Uh, I'll throw them out at you, and you can feel free to chew on them and order them. Oh, answer them however you think. But one person was asking, you know, when you are providing documentation to your customers, what's the final format? Is it a Word doc? Is that basically the standard that people receive uh, documentation these days? Uh, is it Markdown? Is it HTML? Is you know, is it very? Uh, it depends. My current job, I'm not doing a whole lot of. Uh, delivering tools directly to the customer. Most of it's internal. Um, at previous jobs, we did deliver things. Um, it depended on how it was worded in the statement of work. So it, again, that's not really a great answer. Uh, we usually try to do PDF. That way the customer couldn't change it. Uh, it depends on how paranoid your company is and that, what kind of attorneys you have. So if your attorneys are just generally paranoid and think that everybody's out to get them, they're going to try to they're going to err on the side of protection, right? They're going to be more defensive. Make it a PDF so it's harder to, to tweak it and say that we gave them wrong information. Um, if they're more focused on just getting them the content, it could be anything from HTML to Word to Markdown, whatever, you know, whatever the customer prefers. Now, there are projects where you're, you're contracted to build software for a customer. That's a bit different. We do have people in my company that that's what they do. I don't know what they provide in that case. I'd have to defer to them um, as far as what their documentation is. I think it's hosted in an online content management system. Um, I think they use SharePoint, to be honest with you, but I know places that use Confluence and things like that uh, and JIRA. Um, I did a, a project out in Silicon Valley back in 2017. I think they were using Confluence. So that was all... Um, open source, you know, Apache, Linux, and that type of thing. So it depends on what the customer wants and what your engagement is. So it's hard to give you a one-size-fits-all answer because as a consultant, you're kind of this universal adapter that has to fit to whatever, you know. You're going to fit to whatever they're trying to ask you to do, and if you can fit, you do. If you can't, you say, well, I can't do it and move on to the next one. Um, I think that's the point, right? It's not yeah. a one-size-fits-all because – you're, you're a consultant. Customers have different asks. You're trying to make the customer happy at the end of the day, and you're willing to adapt the things that you guys do to the requirements of the, the customers, really, what it comes down to. Yes. And some of them will actually give you the system and say, put it here. Okay. Good. So we also had another question. Um, uh, Jeremy was wondering, you, you know, you talked about the modules earlier and pulling modules online. Have you run into situations where people have deployed a lot of modules in their environment, and then how do you sort of manage the idea of keeping those modules up to date? Now that they've been installed on a machine, they're sort of, unless someone wrote, goes and runs a manual update at that machine, they're sort of mm -hmm. in time. Yeah. Have you ever come across those kinds of situations? Uh, not yeah, but I can see that coming. Um, and there's ways to address that, but yeah, I, the reason I haven't seen it yet is because most places will, and, and just because of force of habit, they'll pick certain boxes to do things. Like here's a server that's going to do this. Like all of our scheduled jobs run on this box, right? Like a jump server. Uh huh. So they'll do that. Like a lot of, um, depending on the role. So if it's database stuff, they run it here. If it's, you know, uh, identity stuff, they run it there and so forth and so on. So uh, more and more is getting run in the cloud. Uh, as far as running out in the wild, um, I, I did touch on that a bit 
I wrote a module once called Fudge Pop, which was out of a bet. <laughs> this is kind of stupid. So I wrote a bet that I could do a lot of the things Intune does with just PowerShell and GitHub. And it was a $5 bet, but I won. Um, so basically, one of the functions they wanted to know is, can you enforce deploying PowerShell modules and keeping them up to date? And the answer is yes, you can. You, you can do that. So as long as you set up some infrastructure that says, you know, this process is going to run, check in here, pull this down and run it, whatever, then you just give it instructions to do whatever you do. Um, now, you can do that all sorts of ways. Uh, today, there's just, it's ridiculous. There's an unlimited number of ways to do that. So if you have a, an environment where people are putting PowerShell modules on all kinds of machines, oof, well, first off, um, that, that, yeah, that can be tough. So if you're using something like uh, Configuration Manager, you could leverage that to pull inventory. That's one way. Another way is just do PowerShell to query all that. Um, there's other tools. You could do it with Landesk or Altiris or Tivoli or anything else that's out there. Um, if there's an agent or some agentless way to monitor a machine, it's just querying. It's really file system stuff that you're querying. So you could always um, query that way or run a local PowerShell function and get back a result. So there's ways to deal with that. I would recommend against being that distributed if you can. I mean, if you have to, you have to. But if if maintaining versions is going to be a major challenge, I would try to limit where it runs so you don't have to maintain it as in many places. I wish we had uh, Stevie Costa on the call because I bet you that's a function that's covered in, in Chocolate's page version. That is probably <laughs> you know because Chocolate, you think about it, right? You could just say Choco update and it's going to check your machine against the repository and pull down everything. So I'm sure there's a way to do that with modules. Uh, there probably is. And just uh, no compensation here. I freaking love chocolatey. So can't say enough good about it. All right. Um, so what else did we have? That was – someone wanted to know if you – if you want – if you – do you find yourself ever having to extend PowerShell and go – Pass PowerShell to a different language, like C Sharp or something like that. Ooh. Um, not right now, not in this role. I mean, I, I know people that do, um, but for what I'm doing personally, I have not had to do that. And I do leverage .NET, um, sort of like Reflection, basically, you know, the square brackets where you pull in the full class, whatever. Um, that's been really helpful. One of the things, um, kind of a side note, working on this, one of those REST APIs, actually, it was much easier to do it in PowerShell ISE because of the way it can auto expand those things where VS Code can't do that yet. Um, it's like once I've actually instantiated their API, I could just type the last part of their API after the square bracket. So a left square bracket, name, hit tab, and it would expand that whole ridiculously long this dot this dot that. Um, to, to basically drill down into their class structure, right? That's leveraging .NET, but ISE it, it does that a lot more um, smoothly than VS Code. If it can do it in VS Code, I haven't figured out how to do it, but if anybody out there knows how, let me know. Um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, I could demo that, but I'll let you tell me if I need to do that. No? <laughs> No, no, I think we're okay. good. We're kind of, you know, we're kind of getting late on time too. So I think, um, I think we're doing good. I think if you had anything more. I think, I, I think this has been re really refreshing and understanding, you know, how other people are using PowerShell, doing some discovery, and you know, kind of you know, information from the field. And I, I think this has been a great talk so far. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm glad this was helpful, and hope, hope it was interesting. I, I don't want to sound like I don't want to sound pompous. I don't want to sound like, hey, I'm, I'm the consultant because I'm just one of hundreds and thousands of consultants out there. But if you talk to most of them nowadays, anybody who touches Microsoft products, they'll tell you, you know, PowerShell is, is a huge part of that now. It, it, especially in the last three to five years, it's just gone from in the background to right at the top. And um, it really is sort of your, your Leatherman all-in-one toolkit to, to do things, even when you're dealing with non-Microsoft stuff. So for anybody that's on the fence about it, uh, I know you've heard it before, learn it, learn it, learn it. Just, yeah, start playing with it, learn it. Start Find something you can use it on. 
okay, here's this problem. How can PowerShell fit that versus I'm just going to learn PowerShell. Um, I, I two customers in the last week actually they came back and said that was what got them over the hump was finding something they needed to use it on. Once they had that, it was the hook that took them off in that journey, and, and then they've just gone miles with it in a very short time. Cool. All right, um, Mike. Were there any other questions? Any oh. Oh, learning resources. Yeah, great stuff. I, I'm, you know, I'm very thankful for you, uh, you know, sharing your time with us. And I think it's definitely a unique experience to uh, to the research triangle you use. So I think it's really good. I just want to remind the guys that are on the call here. Um, the way that we usually go here is this kind of just devolves into an open chat, and David is welcome to head for the hills or stick around as long as he wants. But remember, guys, unmute your mics and feel free to comment. We can talk about things that David spoke about. You can expand on things that maybe he touched upon that he never had a chance to ask him. Or maybe you want to go in a different direction. But we don't have to sit here silent. Um, feel free to open up those mics. And if you want to just get a conversation going, that's fine. If not, we do appreciate your time. Um, and uh, we will get you some more information on future stuff. This will be this will be posted on YouTube. I don't know about tomorrow with a holiday is the day after. But um, David, thank you very much. I I enjoyed it very much too. It's a nice little break from doing code to talk about different viewpoints. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate this. Yeah, and then uh, Tegan, we can turn this off or Mike if we still have time. Yeah, I could. I guess I could do that. Just so that you know, we don't want to trim too much up again. All right, cool. Yeah, everybody open up your mics if you